The ability to practice law is a privilege granted by a state or other jurisdiction to those who satisfy the requirements for bar admission. Like many privileges, it comes with some responsibilities, some mandatory and some aspirational. One typically aspirational responsibility is to give back to society by devoting a meaningful amount of time at no charge to advising or representing those who cannot afford to pay for legal services. The Latin term for that type of service is pro bono publico, which means for the public good, and which is often shortened to pro bono. Pro bono work can be rewarding not only for the clients who benefit from the services, but also for the lawyers, law firms, and other organizations that provide them. In this episode of Higher Callings, I interview Emily Cook, a transactional lawyer in the Portland, Maine office of my law firm, Pierce Atwood, who leads the firm's pro bono program. Among other questions, I asked Emily about why law firms and individual lawyers take on pro bono work, about how a form of practice typically viewed as litigation focused can be supported by attorneys who are not litigators, and about the firm's recently developed Racial Justice Initiative. I'm with Emily Cook, who is an attorney in the Portland, Maine office of Pierce Atwood. Hello, Emily. Hi, Don. Good to see you today. I don't know what it's like in Portland, Maine today, but I will say in Massachusetts, the weather is absolutely perfect today, and I I don't know why I want to be inside recording a podcast. It is perfect New England weather here in Maine. Agreed. So um, you you are a member of our business practice group, and you're the head of our banking practice at Pierce Atwood, and you lead the firm's pro bono program. So today we're going to talk about pro bono um, and especially how law firms in general and Pierce Atwood in particular Um, carry out their responsibilities to do pro bono work. Before we get into that, and before I introduce you to the listeners, I think it's important that we understand what we're talking about when we use the phrase pro bono. You know, pro bono has somewhat different meanings to different people. I think different law firms have different policies about what does and doesn't constitute pro bono work. Um, But how do you define pro bono? Thanks, Don, and it's great to be here talking with you. Um, You know, I go to the ABA model rules definition. Um, It's, you know, it's been vetted and a lot of thought has gone into it and it really covers the waterfront. Um, The definition includes legal services provided at low or no fee to individuals of limited means That is sort of the core traditional definition, but it does go beyond that. It recognizes that um, pro bono and the potential for impact of of pro bono legal service extends to organizations that provide and provide services to and support individuals of limited means, but also to charitable organizations doing mission-based work where their budgets would not support the payment of traditional legal fees. Great. Thank you. I, it's, um, I know that sometimes law firms talk about community service work, which can be different from pro bono work because it doesn't really fall in the definition you just described. And uh, the, the real focus, I, I'm glad that you went back to the ABA definition because I think the real focus generally is helping indigent people who couldn't otherwise afford legal services. Yeah, that, that's spot on. Yeah. Um, so before we get into it more deeply, let's back up a little bit and talk about you um, and how you ended up at Pierce Atwood and how you ended up running the firms or leading the firms pro bono program at Pierce Atwood. So tell, tell us a little bit about your background and, and anything in particular, Emily, that would have given any kind of hint that you would be focusing a good bit of your time on pro bono legal work. Sure. Well, I was an anthropology major at Dartmouth. Um, and I think, you know, 
I was drawn to the law for a variety of reasons, not least of all sort of the human connection. I, you know, trace that back to my anthro background in undergrad. Um, I also spent time before going to law school working for a nonprofit that was doing international development work. Um, and while I ultimately concluded I was likely to be a better lawyer than an international development specialist, much as I aspire, I would have aspired to be, be that as well. Um, I, I ultimately, I guess it's not a surprise given that background that, um, you know, I wanted to complement my traditional kind of corporate attorney practice with the ability to work with individuals in the community um, and directly with people who could use the support, um, you know, one way or another. Before I came to Pierce Atwood, I spent five years at Cleary Gottlieb as an associate there in the in the banking and corporate groups. And that is a firm with a storied long-standing and prominent commitment to pro bono. Uh, so it was sort of nothing new or shocking to come here. And I guess I, when I came here, I guess I should note as well, I went to Georgetown for law school. And um, of course, that school also has a long-standing sort of, you know, intrinsic commitment to pro bono service, both in terms of the Jesuit tradition and in terms of the, the school's culture all in all. Now, law firms have been doing pro bono programs for decades. Um, and I think just to start to drill down a little bit, it would be good to talk about a little bit, why do law firms do that? You know, what is it about the practice of law that carries with it this pro bono commitment that many law firms have? Um, you know, I, I've been practicing long enough that I I can almost pinpoint when the legal profession started to shift from a focus and emphasis on lawyers being professionals to a focus more on we're a business and there's a real business emphasis. And a lot of law firms are very focused on the bottom line and profitability in a way that they weren't, I think, before the 1980s, perhaps. But why does somebody, why does an organization that is really focused on business issues also devoting so much time as law firms do today on pro bono? I'm going to give you a, a longish answer and it's not a warm, fuzzy answer. Um, you know, you could sort of start from the end of the spectrum of it's the right thing to do or we have a moral obligation. Don't disagree. But I think there's, you know, my answer to that is um, in some ways more prosaic and in some ways more utilitarian, but to me, for very important reasons. So I'm going to start with number one. <laughs> Our bar rules require it, right? So every state's bar rules exhort lawyers to perform as part of their professional obligation pro bono legal services, not community service, also important, pro bono legal services, as you discussed earlier, you know, to the indigent or to, to organizations serving civic and community ends, right? Some of those states, in fact, have mandatory hour requirements, but all of them have an exhortation, as far as I know. And when you say exhortation, I mean, you're talking about aspirational policies, Correct. not mandatory rules. In That's other words, correct. a lawyer can't be disbarred because they're not doing pro bono work. And many lawyers don't do pro bono work. But it is, I know it is an aspiration, I think, in many jurisdictions, certainly my own in Massachusetts and yours in Maine, um, that lawyers devote a good amount of time or a real substantial amount of time to doing pro bono work, right? So that, that's what you mean by exhortation. It's that is correct. That's okay. exactly what I mean. And and I would say it is frequently referred to as aspirational. In fact, in some of the bar rules, it's referred to as aspirational. But I think sometimes that gives it a little bit. It's a little easy to give it a pass when we read the the language of those rules and certainly the you know ABA's model rule. It's a pretty strong expectation, even without a mandatory number attached to it. Um, so that's kind of the mechanical answer, right? We're actually all supposed to be doing it if we read our own bar rules. Um, but then the more interesting question 
beneath that, Don, is I think, okay, so why? <laughs> why do we have that? You know, is it just, again, is it just because it's the right thing to do or it feels good? I, I, I go back, maybe it's boring or old fashioned, but I, I go back to, there is a very specific underlying rationale in my view, and it's, I didn't come up with this on my own. We are a self-regulated profession, right? Society has made a deal with us. <laughs> the cops don't come if we commit malpractice. We manage our own professional obligations internally as lawyers. And in my view and the view of many, the trade we've made to do that is we've said, oh, and by the way, keep your hands off. We'll take care of ourselves, but we're going to give back. As a profession, we're going to contribute to society and in a specific way. Again, there are lots of great ways that lawyers contribute in their personal lives, but we are going to use our professional skills to contribute legal services to society. I, again, I promised you a long answer, so I'm going to give you, I'm going to add to that. You know, the other reason that is often cited why it's important for lawyers to do pro bono legal service is because, and again, this there's a utilitarian aspect to this, but it really matters. Um, if the legal system and the justice system is bifurcated, if it's only there to produce good results for those who have the resources to do so, folks lose faith in the system ultimately that's bad for lawyers and much more importantly it's bad for society i don't think we're there yet <laughs> i think we know we're not to the point where where access to justice is equal but contributing pro bono legal services is the way to get closer to that you know we were talking a minute ago about the rules in the various jurisdictions before this interview i i looked up the Massachusetts rules. And I, I just want to read a little bit of that if I could. Please. Um, there's a section that on professional responsibilities of lawyers that talks about the lawyer as a public citizen. And uh, part of that reads as follows. A lawyer should be mindful of deficiencies in the administration of justice and of the fact that the poor and sometimes persons who are not poor cannot afford adequate legal assistance and should therefore devote professional time and civic influence in their behalf. A lawyer should aid the legal profession in pursuing these objectives and should help the bar regulate itself in the public interest. So, you know, interesting part of that is the, the repeated use of the word should. It doesn't say must, it says should, but it is an expectation that uh, the the bar authorities and the courts have for lawyers in the various jurisdictions. I agree. What, uh, what, Emily, uh, why do individual lawyers decide to do it? I mean, it's, it's one thing to say it's a good thing for law firms to do and, and lawyers are expected to do it, but if it's not mandatory and it pro bono work depends on lawyers volunteering their time, and these are lawyers who, for the most part, are very busy with their careers, often very busy with their families and other endeavors. Why do they take on as volunteers the additional work of doing pro bono work for people they don't know, but who need legal representation? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think, while I think the answer probably is as varied as the number of lawyers out there, I think, it, you know, the motivation falls into a couple of broad buckets. One is, um, and I'll get to the sort of what I think is the more exciting one in a moment, but, but one is, you know, if you have a busy corporate practice, so if we're speaking about lawyers at law firms, right, you may spend your day doing a very wide variety of work for a relatively narrow slice of the world, right? It's a wonderful, exciting slice, that's my bread and butter, and I love working for the, the clients that I have worked for my whole career. But boy, you are getting a different slice when you're doing pro bono work. And, and that ranges from the communication style that you're going to use, working with somebody who's not in-house counsel at a multinational corporation, to as we've already alluded to, kind of the life circumstances and challenges that somebody's encountering and why they've they've sought out pro bono legal services. So in terms of, you know, 
something as basic as the diversity of one's day and the the relative sort of interest and excitement that somebody can derive from their docket. I think pro bono legal service adds a component to that. And we'll talk later about the wide variety of pro bono service that our firm sees, um, but it really can make somebody's docket and sort of range of interpersonal interactions interesting and exciting. Um, but I also think there's another really important rationale for doing pro bono and I think motivator for for many attorneys. Um, and that, that's my seatbelt analogy, which you can evaluate if it's a good one or not. You know, in the last year when we've been talking at Pierce Atwood about um, rolling out a racial justice initiative in response to the, we'll talk later, but in response to the protests of last summer and George Floyd's murder, um, I've used the analogy that, you know, when you're sitting on an airplane as a lawyer and they get on the PA and call for a doctor or nurse, you stay in your seat. You might love to help with whatever crisis is happening, but unless you happen to be a JDMD, you sit in your seat and you wait for the expert to raise their hand and take care of it. When we find ourselves as lawyers confronting social inequity or inequitable access to justice that we actually have the skills to fix, <laughs> that's like they called for a lawyer on the PA system. <laughs> that's when you get out of your seat. You, you take your seatbelt off. Right. I mean, a lot of us, last summer is a good crystallizing example, but if you're paying any attention, most of the time, you're probably feeling frustrated when you read the news that there are lots of problems in the world that you can't help solve. But the problems of inequitable access to justice and folks who are disempowered getting oppressed within a system that doesn't afford them protection or rights, you as a lawyer actually can take your seatbelt off. You actually have skills that can make a difference in that setting. To me, that's a very exciting motivator. And I think it is for many lawyers. Yeah. I, you know, I think that doing pro bono work or at least doing the right pro bono work can make you feel a lot better about yourself as a lawyer and as a member of society. I I had a large pro bono case years ago before I joined Pierce Atwood that went on for several years and we ended up with a great result. I'm now pretty late in my career. I've been doing this for a long time, litigation. But um, when I think back to what are the highlights of my career, that's the first highlight. It's that one case. And it was something that my law firm that I was with at the time allowed me to do for free. Um, and it actually encouraged me and, and took pride in, in what I and the rest of the team that were working on the case did. Um, so there is a real strong sense of fulfillment, personal satisfaction and fulfillment that can yes. come from doing, you know, a good pro bono case or something where you feel like you're really making a difference in somebody's life, even if the firm isn't billing that client and making money off of that. And and the law firms that support that, like Pierce Atwood, you know, deserve a lot of credit for for doing that. Okay. Um, I want to I want to change gears just a little bit, and I'm going to go a little out of the order that you and I talked about, okay. but. Um, I want to stay on this sort of pro bono generally before we talk about specific examples of Pierce Atwood work. Um, but one of the rationales I think that law firms have for supporting pro bono work is it gives some younger lawyers opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have at early stages of their careers. I know, for example, it's harder to get into court now for a young litigator than it was when I started out. And pro bono cases are often a good way for a young lawyer to get into court. Do you see that? I mean, and and is that something that um, is important to a law firm or or to the lawyers that are involved that they're getting some advanced training in in a sense? I I think it's absolutely spot on. Um, I think it's most true for litigators for the reason you mentioned that the opportunities to actually get into court are fewer and farther between outside of the pro bono space uh, without question. But I think that's exactly right across the board. Um, 
you know, associates oftentimes are the ones to find, identify the pro bono opportunity to get excited about it, to kind of bring the, the initiative. And when that happens, we staff the matter. They've got a supervising senior attorney, just like on they would on any matter. But the fact that they have the opportunity to sort of drive it, um, you know, be be kind of overseeing their own matter with support and and the comfort no of knowing that a you know a team of senior attorneys is behind them, no question in my mind. I also think you know if you're a young lawyer fresh out of law school or early in your career and still figuring out your place in the world to be able to complement a busy, billable, corporate, typical law firm practice with meaningful pro bono for all the reasons you, you alluded to, um, you may be more likely to stick around and find that you can get satisfaction from a traditional business practice because you're complementing it with all of those rewards, no question. And and that's not to say that more senior attorneys shouldn't also be doing pro bono work and um, supervising and training the younger attorneys that they're throwing out there in the pro bono cases to do the work. Um, and I think many senior, more senior attorneys, and when I say senior, I mean anybody from mid career to late career, um, I think many of them do that kind of supervision and training. And it can be a, a good experience overall for the development of a young lawyer, I think. I, I agree completely. And I would say it's certainly true at Pierce Atwood. Um, we don't see, you know, an artificial breakdown where, oh, it's the associates doing it all. And, you know, you sort of drop off in your later years. We have genuinely robust commitment and involvement from attorneys kind of right up the the lifespan, if you will, of, of one's career, for sure. I agree with that. Um, another question I have for you, and you're the perfect person I can ask this of, is we often associate pro bono work with litigation. Uh, you're not a litigator, and yet you are um, the head of our pro bono program at Pierce Atwood, and you do pro bono work yourself, and so do other non-litigators. What role can non-litigators have in pro bono work, and what kinds of things can they do? I am very glad you asked, because I totally agree. That is, um, you know, in my role, in terms of being head of the pro bono program, it's something that I focused on a lot, right? we The last thing we want is for pro bono to be sort of, a, 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 you know, you have to either be a litigator or play one on TV to be able to do it, right? It, it, some of the core, most traditional, most impactful pro bono work is done in the courts, no question, but you are absolutely right that there is a world of pro bono work, even for those who don't feel like dipping their toe in, and those people exist, right? You can be a transactional attorney and agree to pick up litigation light or litigation type work. So. I should say that number one, right? And there are lots of attorneys who who do just that and are willing to go into immigration court, you know, even if in their daily life, that's not where they spend their time. Um, but without question, uh, we've certainly been able, and I think many firms have, to create a space for transactional lawyers who aren't looking to go outside their comfort zone. What form does that take? It's a bunch of things. So for starters, again, back to the ABA model rule, which reminds us pro bono service includes provision of legal services to religious, civic, community, charitable, governmental, and educational organizations in matters in furtherance of their organizational purposes. Right? You're reading right now. Just I am. people yes. who listen might not yes. know. I can see you're yes. actually reading that. That's right. Okay. I figured I'd cite it correctly. Um, <laughs> so... Our firm and many others do a lot of corporate work for nonprofits, mission-driven nonprofits. And by the way, we assess, we don't take on just any nonprofit and throw pro bono services at them. We do assess what they're doing. You know, is their mission in furtherance of civic good, the, the rights of the indigent and the like, environmental rights. Um, so that can range from formation sort of traditional formation work, you'd be amazed or maybe not at the number of folks who have great ideas and they've been kind of out there in the community working and they never got around to incorporating, right? So we do that kind of work. But it also goes to um, 
transactional services of many stripes, employment, real estate, uh, even trust and estates in, in many cases um, for both organizations, nonprofit organizations, again, doing mission-driven work and individual clients. We, at our firm, we have a practice to provide estate planning services and end of life documentation services to individuals of limited means who are terminally ill, right? So that is pure transactional work. It is unquestionably making a difference in the life of somebody. Oftentimes what we're told is um, that is the last piece that's keeping somebody anxious and stressed out at the end of their life, not knowing, have, you know, my affairs aren't in order. I never had the means to hire an attorney to take care of it. And I don't know if I'm, if I'm leaving my relatives, my family members, my loved ones in a bind. Um, and so there's a, a pretty wide array. And again, happy to give more examples. But what we've found is, and I tell every new hire when I'm orienting them to our pro bono program, we will find it. We will find a place for you. You know, we do trademark work on a, on a pro bono basis for deserving organizations. So it's a really wide range. And I appreciate your raising it because there is that kind of traditional assumption or premise that, well, it's mostly for litigators. It's not. Right. So how important is it to have the support of management at a law firm for a pro bono program? I mean, it, it sucks a lot of hours away from what might have gone into the billable hour line for some people. Um, so how important is it that management really get behind it and, and how can management support uh, their lawyers' pro bono work? I think it's dispositive. Um, and I say that partly because I have spoken over the years with many laterals who come from law firm cultures where there wasn't supportive management. And, you know, sometimes to your earlier point, Don, that is a bottom line business reality, right? It's not because they're bad people. Um, but where you're in a law firm culture that doesn't overtly support and promote and encourage pro bono legal service, it's awfully hard to do it. For starters, just you know, totally mechanically, you're going to run into all manner of conflict issues if you're not if you're not providing your pro bono legal services through the auspices of your law firm, right? That's just a prosaic mechanical point that becomes a pretty big issue if you've got folks kind of doing pro bono on the side. I, put that in air quotes for listeners. Yeah, going um, through the conflict system so that if right. there are conflicts, they'll show up and people that's will- That's right, because otherwise they're imputed to the firm and right. you know somebody's out there providing services and, and you know the firm doesn't know about it. But I think more, more generally, um, to your point, taking time from one's billable practice and docket to provide non-billable service, legal services um, is pretty tough if your law firm is implicitly or explicitly saying, we don't want you doing that. <laughs> We're looking for those hours. Where did they go? Um, so without a doubt, I think having that support is essential. I think any smart law firm in this world, um, doesn't mean they're all doing it, but most smart and savvy law firms understand that you know, they ought to be promoting a culture of pro bono for all the reasons we've just talked about and because increasingly RFPs ask about it. Clients want to know what law firms are doing in the pro bono space and in the community space. So there are a whole bunch of good reasons for, for firm management to promote and encourage it. And again, it, it's pretty, going back to our sort of first, the first piece of this conversation, it's really hard for a law firm lawyer to fulfill that exhortation, that professional obligation, if it doesn't, if they don't have the support of the firm behind them. You know, the more I listen to you and think about this, the more I think it's really a no-brainer, right? Um, you not only does it help your own lawyers feel fulfilled in the in some of the work they're doing in their careers, but clients expect it. Uh, law students, when they're deciding what law firms they want to go work for, they're looking for it. A lot of them, uh, lateral hires are looking for it. It's you know, it's a win-win for everybody to really engage in pro bono and have a management that sends a strong signal that the firm is behind it and will support you if you're doing 
uh, a reasonable amount of pro bono. I mean, they don't want their attorneys to be spending all their time on pro bono, but um, to have a substantial amount of time that can be credited towards pro bono work, it, it's just a, absolutely a no-brainer, it seems to me. I agree with that. And, you know, I would add to that um, a little bit in parallel to the, you know, sort of, I don't know if I'd call it conventional wisdom, but the common premise that, you know, pro bono is really a litigation world uh, phenomenon, right? There's also, I think, sometimes a misconception that taking on a pro bono case means I'm it's I'm going to be 50, 100, 200 hours in, right? Um, and, you know, that may make not only law firms, but individual lawyers skittish. And while Many, many law firms, including ours, recognize that and, and celebrate that there are significant pro bono matters and commitments that can require that level of investment and are willing to you know, put the imprimatur of the firm behind that. It's also the case that there are many, 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 many ways to impact somebody's life or the you know, society at large with a much smaller and more discreet time commitment. So that's something that I talk to our lawyers about as well, because I embrace folks who want to take on, a, you know, longitudinal, long-term, multi, you know, tens of hours commitment. But for those who aren't ready to jump in feet first to that, but want to keep their diet of pro bono strong, we've got 10-hour matters and five-hour matters and 20-hour matters and limited rep, you know, clinic-based engagements. So I think that's important for law firm management to remember, and even for individual lawyers who may otherwise feel, well, I can't take on a 150 hour project right now. I'm, you know, I'm loaded up. Um, it doesn't have to look like that. In fact, I think more often than not, it doesn't. You know, you use the word celebrate in your answer. And, and um, I think our firm does a great job of celebrating the accomplishments of our pro bono attor attorneys who are doing significant pro bono work. Can you talk about that a little bit, about how important it is to recognize and celebrate the attorneys who are devoting a significant amount of time to important pro bono matters? And when I say important, I mean, I don't mean important because it's going to be on the front page of the newspaper, but important because it's helping somebody who needs help. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, our earlier conversation about the the sort of dispositive difference between being at a firm that encourages and celebrates pro bono versus not, it gets actualized through cultural cues that the firm really means what they say, right? You know, any firm can have a website kind of for clients, for the, you know, client's sake that says we're committed to pro bono and we have attorneys who do it. But for individual attorneys to buy into that, believe that, really feel that, you know, it's not just lip service. And if I do have time, you know, pro bono time on my docket, there's not some, you know, implicit disappointment with me about that. I, I, celebrating that is the way to show it. It's a way to show it. It's an important way to show it. So at our firm, we have an annual pro bono awards ceremony. We give awards in front of, you know, the whole firm uh, joined by video conference every year and family members uh, of those receiving awards um, to individuals who have done, had significant pro bono successes to individuals who have had Im important successes within the community. So staff members who have provided volunteer service, not lawyers, but contributing to the community. And that's one of a number of ways you know, something like that is is one of a number of ways that a firm can kind of put its money where its mouth is and demonstrate, yeah, we really mean it. <laughs> when when you interviewed and we said we care about pro bono or we said we want you doing pro bono, we meant it. And, you know, we show it on an annual basis. Other ways, you know, we put out um, a, kind of a glossy annual pro bono and community service report that goes to all of our client contacts. Again, a way to demonstrate um, internally as well as externally, that it really is an important part of the culture, not just sort of something we do so we can, you know, check that box and, and move on. You know, we had our celebration, what, a week or two ago, yeah. um, our annual celebration of pro bono. And I've got to say, it's one of the most feel-good 
things we do as a law firm. It, it was it's always such a joy to watch that and participate in it. And I also uh, getting ready for this interview, I reread our 2019 pro bono uh, summary of the year 2019 in pro bono at Pierce Atwood. I know the 2021 is coming out soon, um, but boy, it's so inspiring to read what people are doing. And, and um, it, it just makes you really feel good to be part of a law firm that supports that. And, and it helps, I think, make us a more cohesive unit as a law firm, more of a family type of feel than it would be um, if we weren't doing that. So, Thank so you. let's let's transition here. And um, now that we just mentioned um, how we celebrate and recognize pro bono, maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of the pro bono work that people in the firm have been doing. I will do my best. It is, as you saw in the 2019 report, a remarkably diverse landscape. It would be virtually impossible to sort of summarize it all. Um, I guess you know, what I would say is we, we really are ecumenical without trying to be all things to all people or so diffuse in our efforts that we can't have an impact. But we really do try to meet our lawyers where they are, right? So if someone's, you know, I'm in, like I said, I'm a trademarks lawyer, please help me find pro bono work in that space. We'll find it. Um, we work through, Piers Atwood works through a number of pro bono referral partners. We have very strong relationships across our footprint with many organizations that really are working in the trenches. They are doing the work every day, vetting clients, identifying opportunities, fielding requests. And that ranges from immigration work, CASA work, so the rights of, of children within the, the foster system, um, we have a partnership, a very robust partnership with the Conservation Law Foundation's Legal Services Food Hub, which works to support farmers and food entrepreneurs working toward a more sustainable New England food system. Um, we work with arts organizations and ultimately identify worthy nonprofits working in the arts space within our communities and provide, you know, as referred to before, corporate and other transactional support to those. Um, we work with volunteer lawyer programs in virtually all of our, you know, under various rubrics in virtually all of our um, jurisdictions where we're admitted, where we have offices. Um, and that's really how we identify indigent clients, clients, individuals of limited means that we, we have no, <laughs> no particular aptitude for vetting individual clients ourselves. Uh, that would be difficult, time consuming, and we'd probably get it wrong a lot of the time, but through very strong partnerships with uh, VLP here in Maine and similar organizations throughout New England and in DC, we're able to identify worthy individual clients um, for the firm. And I think we get referrals to from immigration organizations as well. We absolutely um, do with strong partnerships in Massachusetts and, yeah. and Maine. And we do a, a lot of immigration and asylum work. Having those partnerships is just so important. I remember when I, when I was a younger lawyer and I was interested in doing pro bono work, I, it wasn't easy to figure out how do you actually get a pro bono case? Where do they come from? Um, being able to affiliate or, or at least have connections with clearing houses that will be vetting clients and then looking for attorneys to represent them is so important, I think, to getting that kind of work that we want to do. That's right. Um, so can you give some more examples? I mean, what are some of the highlights of, of some of the work we've been doing recently? So. We've recently had, you know, in 2020 was a special year, um, goes without saying. And, you know, in some ways, the successes of 2020 um, sort of highlight the, the problems, right? I mean, you know, in 2020, we successfully obtained habeas for an individual in immigration asylum who had languished for 11 months um, and, you know, successfully working alongside that individual's immigration attorney were able to obtain habeas uh, for that client. Um, we took on, we launched an eviction defense team in 2020 
we had done eviction work and housing work over time on a pro bono basis, <clears throat> much of it in Massachusetts. But in 2020, we sort of said, as we're looking at the cascading series of crises that were rolling out it during the year, that was an area that we anticipated need across all of our offices and all of our jurisdictional footprint. Um, for the reasons we all know, the cascading you know, eviction crisis precipitated by job losses, precipitated by COVID. Um, and we have represented folks in dire straits in, in, on the eviction side of things. Um, I should mention, you know, that extends to both working on a limited representation basis through the Lawyer of the Day program of the Eastern Massachusetts Housing Court. That's something that our colleague right. Joel Quick has done for a long time. Right. Um, and that's courageous work that requires going to the courthouse and being ready for anything in a mass of folks who are in crisis. And this predates COVID um, and being the attorney, sometimes just <laughs> being there, hearing you know, 20 minutes worth of background and agreeing to represent a client on a limited representation basis can be the difference between buying somebody another month to find new housing and seeing them evicted and out on the street with no no options and no time to to plan. That lawyer for a day program in the housing court in Massachusetts has been a huge success. It's been around for at least a decade, more than a decade, I think. Um, and the limited representation aspect of it is important. Um, maybe you can explain what that means a little bit. Absolutely. Um, so. Under the bar rules, it is possible, and this is important, you're right, it's important for kind of pro bono generally and for folks to understand, under the bar rules, it's possible to take on representation on a so-called limited rep basis, right? So um, what that does in a nutshell without going into you know deep mechanics is it allows lawyers serving in certain typically clinic style settings, right? You're there on site, for a day or an afternoon or a morning or whatever it may be. Um, and rather than being required to take on kind of the you know traditional conflict check obligations, right, which can be time consuming and may preclude for someone from showing up at a homeless legal clinic, a lawyer of the day program in the housing court or the like, um, the, the limited rep rule protects lawyers who are providing legal services in that type of setting on a limited basis. It also means that when you leave, when you go home that night or that afternoon, um, the the representation is terminated. So again, you can have some agility and nimbleness to provide advice and counsel and support during your time appearing in that setting without concerns that, geez, you know, did I vet this client or this matter adequately that I can take it on for the next 18 months if that's what it requires? You're in and out, but you've provided a very important, very significant role in your time on site that day. Mm -hmm. So we also started something called the Racial Justice Initiative. You alluded to it earlier. What is that program? Great question. Um, so again, uh, 2020, for all the wrong reasons, presented many opportunities for lawyers to try to figure out how to help. And as we know, the murder of George Floyd and the resulting protests highlighted a reality that was <laughs> there, you know, candidly in front of our faces, I think, for, for much longer and much and long before that, um, that there are ingrained systemic racial inequities that affect virtually all aspects of U.S. society. Many of those are susceptible to legal interventions. I don't say legal solutions because I think there's a, it, this requires sort of a comprehensive commitment across society, but but certainly many of them are legal in nature. Many of the inequities are both legal inequities and, and in some cases, susceptible to legal interventions. Knowing that, and with the seatbelt analogy in mind, right, you know, we're, many of us 
were wringing our hands in the wake of the protests, like so many, feeling powerless, impotent. You know, it was a crappy summer to start with. And, and then we're sort of confronting our own sense of powerlessness, recognizing these, these ingrained inequities. And three associates at Pierce Atwood, with the strong support of the management team, the managing partner, and the pro bono team, sat down and said, let's move from hand wringing to action. And let's figure out what that might look like. You know, I think, and I think as you're saying this, a lot of organizations, including law firms, were putting out statements in the wake of the George Floyd murder about how they support racial equity. But those were just words if they weren't backed up by action. And and I think what I, what I believe to have happened at Pierce Atwood, and I'm sure at other places as well, is firm management and others said, well, words aren't enough. We actually have to do something. That's exactly right. And so we sat around a table and fairly quickly determined that there should be several aspects to any kind of concerted racial justice initiative at Pierce Atwood. Um, one, it ought to be available to, per our conversation earlier, both litigation and transactional attorneys, right? I mean, we all want to contribute. Two, it should include a combination of novel areas, because we're trying to stretch ourselves, but also areas where Pierce Atwood has a track record and, and successes in the past, right? We, we didn't want to sort of be doing all stuff we've already done, because that's not much of an initiative, or all totally brand new stuff, because the risk that, you know, you sort of get out over your skis seemed considerable to us. So we ended up with a combination. And our racial justice initiative has, as a result, three prongs at Pierce Atwood. The first is civil rights litigation. Okay, we've done that for years. Uh, that takes the form of uh, litigation on in support of um, folks within the in, who are incarcerated, who are experiencing racially disparate effects within the justice system, within the system of incarceration, um, folks who have been the subject of uh, pretextual or racially disparate encounters with law enforcement, folks who are experiencing adverse consequences uh, within the immigration system with a racially disparate effect. So civil rights litigation is one prong, and that was not new for us, but we agreed to concentrate our efforts and do more in that space. The next prong is expungement and record sealing. So this is like totally new for Pierce Atwood, which we thought was really exciting. But a number of our lawyers individually had had some experience um, and and familiarity with this space. Now, what does that mean? What, yeah, what, I'll what does that it. work? Um, so it, the term ta there are different terms in different jurisdictions: expungement, record sealing, and annulment. All of it refers to um, an individual with a form of criminal record, one kind or another, who is eligible to have that expunged, annulled, removed from their record. And there are various reasons one may be eligible for that. Um, what we have found is, number one, and, and by the way, we did not, our firm did not invent the wheel on this. Importantly, we agreed to work almost exclusively through pro bono partners who are already doing this work. It's one of the reasons we chose this prong because we felt, you know, it could be new for us, but we could be contributing to kind of existing efforts in this space. So what those providers have identified, and this will not surprise anyone who's not been living under a rock. Um, first of all, arrest records often for petty offenses are not racially equitable, right? They are not distributed with racial equity. Uh, they are they disproportionately affect citizens, residents of color, individuals of color. Um, secondly, and paired with that, those records have collateral consequences that often follow folks for their whole lives. They make it difficult to get a job in their chosen profession. They make it more difficult to obtain rental housing. The list is very long of collateral consequences. Oftentimes, individuals are 
totally eligible to have their records expunged so they can no longer face those collateral consequences, which have roots in racial inequity. And yet it's a process that usually requires legal skills. You got to go to the individual courthouse oftentimes. You got to file the right papers. But for a small contribution by attorneys, you get a very significant and very exciting milestone in somebody's life. Just to give one example, we have a client, we served a client through our expungement prong who is a parent of kids, a professional within a, a licensed profession who had among a, you know, a number of arrest records, among other things for unlawful activity, colon, littering. And this among other petty offenses was precluding this individual from finding work in, in their chosen profession and was entirely and fully eligible to have that expunged, it required the work of Pierce Atwood lawyers to kind of go through the steps and the pieces. So hardly the glamorous type of pro bono work that you see in the movies. It's uh, really just people getting down and doing what needs to be done to help others who, who need our help, but in a way that you know, there's no spotlight on it. There's no glory to be had in it. But you have the reward of knowing that you really did make a significant difference in that person's life. I agree with that. And I would add, it, I suppose different folks evaluate this differently. But but to me, there is no substitute for working with one individual <laughs> and making a material difference in that individual's life. I've been in that situation, others have, and there are times when that feels more glamorous on balance than many of the above the fold transactions that we end up right. closing in a given year. I've certainly had that that experience myself. Yeah. Um, the third prong of our of our racial justice initiative is, dear to my heart, a transactional prong. Under that prong, again, we didn't want to leave anyone out in the cold within the Piers Atwood umbrella. Within that prong of our initiative, we have redoubled our efforts to provide corporate formation, governance, and other transactional services to nonprofit organizations working to secure racial justice and equity or combat inequity, as well as ultimately developing something like a catalyst program for entrepreneurs of color, businesses founded by entrepreneurs of color who very often, again, due to entrenched social and, and systemic inequities, have oftentimes lacked access to traditional sources of capital. Um, so we continue to design that program because that's one that you want to design with and, and frankly promote with humility um, and, and real thought and deliberation. How does, uh, how do lawyers who are not members of racial or ethnic minorities um, find that work, support that work, and do it in a way that is well received by the recipients of the work? I think it goes back to a number of themes you and I have already talked about, maybe plus one. <clears throat> so for starters, partnering, just like we do in all of our other pro bono work, right? partnering with organizations who are on the ground doing the work. Um, we don't pretend to be the experts in racial equity, um, but it doesn't mean we should sit, stay in our seats with the seatbelt on either. So it is as valuable, if not more so in this space as any pro bono space to work through pro bono partners, work through the organizations that have the relationships in the community without question. I guess that's number one. Um, number two is, you know, back to my now overused analogy, we shouldn't be afraid, we shouldn't be, <clears throat> we shouldn't do nothing because we're afraid that doing something, we might do it wrong, right? So starting somewhere and recognizing we have a lot of power and privilege. And if that's the problem we're trying to solve is tackling <laughs> lack of access to power and privilege, using that regardless of our ethnic identity, is super important and a really important way to kind of interrupt the, the problem we've identified. The third that I would add that's sort of special to this space, although common to 
working with individuals of limited means, working with folks in the immigration system is absolutely, and you put your finger on it implicitly, to approach it, approach this work with humility, right? To recognize that we bring one component of the solution, one puzzle piece. It's an important one. It's a necessary one, but but it's not sufficient. Ultimately, we need to be poised to listen to the folks who have experienced the problems we're trying to help solve. We have to have our ears open if we're working with an individual who has experienced the consequences of systemic inequity. Let's not assume we know exactly what that means or what it's like. Let's be prepared. And, you know, as lawyers, we've got that we have some advantages and disadvantages in this area. Let's be prepared to really listen with humility to somebody's experience before diving in with our toolkit or ripping the seatbelt off. Emily, listening to you talk about our pro bono program and your enthusiasm and the enthusiasm of those lawyers in our firm who are doing pro bono work um, reminds me of why I joined this firm to begin with. And it, it really is emblematic, I think, of the culture that I discerned when I interviewed with the firm 10 years ago. I was, I was put in a conference room in Portland with not one lawyer at a time, but with a whole group of lawyers, one of whom is now our managing partner. And um, it was the warmest feeling I've ever had being around other lawyers um, who were trying to recruit you or, or uh, you know, really convey what the firm was about. And, and I think Pierce Atwood is about um, really having a holistic view of what the practice of law is, which includes a significant pro bono component. So it's just great to, to listen to you talk about it and to hear your enthusiasm about it. I know that the firm as a whole is, is very enthusiastic about our pro bono program and the ways that we help people in our various communities. Let me, let, let me uh, just transition and wrap this up with this question for you. Do you have any advice or recommendations for law firms or lawyers who are interested in getting more involved in pro bono? It's a good question. <clears throat> I think in some ways preparing for today's conversation and thinking about these themes in kind of an organized fashion um, did make me think, you know, first of all, it was a reminder, kind of going back, reading the bar rules was a reminder. We are all expected to do it. So I would encourage young lawyers, new lawyers to start from that premise. And I would encourage law firms to start from that premise. We're actually supposed to be doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's not it's not meant to be kind of it's not meant to be like volunteer work, which we all sort of choose to do in our own ways at our own times or not. Right. It really is a component of our profession. Um, and I think, you know, if law, if if young new lawyers or even senior lawyers start from that premise and then figure out how, okay, fine. It's a, it's, I'm supposed to be doing this. Now what? Um, we go a long way. And for law firms that find themselves on the fence, we've talked about the, you and I have talked today about the importance of partnering with the, the organizations who are doing the work, the organizations who exist to provide low or no fee legal services to those who need it within the community. Um, they're, you know, they're your best friend if you're a law firm just starting out, not sure where to begin. You don't have to build the capacity to identify indigent clients within your own community. If you're a corporate law firm, that's, again, as I said earlier, it's not where you're, as, you're not built for that. But what you absolutely should already have is the relationships within the community to be able to leverage the partnerships that you may have or you can build with folks who are doing it um, and, and offer offer to be there for them and then make it authentic. I can tell you that with our racial justice initiative and in particular with our expungement prong, although as well with, with our kind of doubling down on civil rights litigation, we knew it would be a long game. Last summer, there were a lot of law firms raising their hand to tell the ACLU that they were there to help. 
we knew that that couldn't be, well, we mean for the next couple of months. If you're, if you're booked before October, then don't call us. We knew that we needed to be there for the long haul. And I think that's another point for law firms to know in working with partners in the community. You know, and I'm thinking about your seatbelt analogy, which I love. I had never heard that before. It's a good one. And um, yes, we're expected to do pro bono. It's not the only thing we do and or that other law firms do. We we also do things like cleaning up parks. You know, we take a day off where our people might go to a park, a, a community park and clean it up. We might go to a food bank and help package food so that it can be distributed to the poor. But the thing is, those things can be done by anybody. It doesn't take lawyers to do that. But the pro bono legal work we do is the time when that seatbelt light goes on and the people in the cockpit are saying, is anybody here who can provide legal representation and service to these people who need it? And that's when we do need to take our seatbelts off and get out of our seats and pitch in uh, in a way that we, no one else can who doesn't have the skill sets that lawyers have and the training and licenses that lawyers have. So this has been a lot of fun. I, this has been a great conversation. I've enjoyed uh, my time talking with you and, and listening to you. Is there, do you have any last words you want to convey to anybody who happens to listen to this? I think I might borrow somebody else's words um, and piggyback on, on what you just said, because um, my law school alma mater, Georgetown, says it, I think, really well, and I'm going to read, read listeners. <clears throat> Georgetown says to its students... Georgetown Law says to its students, almost anyone can do volunteer work, tutoring, coaching soccer, etc. But lawyers have a unique set of skills and knowledge that can be used to expand access to justice for those who might not otherwise have it. I think that it says it all. You're absolutely right. We do many things in the community and we should as, as citizens and members of, of our various communities. Um, but we also have the, this unique, unique tool. Nobody else does. And lucky us, we should use it. We are very fortunate. Yes. So Emily, thank you. Thank this has you. been a wonderful conversation. I, I um, look forward to continuing the thank conversation you, as we encounter each other throughout the firm. It sounds great. It's been delightful. Thanks for having me. And thank you for all you do and, and for the rest of our pro bono lawyers for all the wonderful things they do for people who need our help. Our pleasure. So. Thank you. you too. This has been an episode of Higher Callings. Your host is Donald Federico. Music is provided by Fancy Mountain, and our logo was designed by Matt Pedro. Higher Callings is edited by Brian Federico. Higher Callings is a production of Federico Media, LLC. 